guys, here are your video notes for the rest of the biochem unit. So these notes are just going to focus on the chemistry basics that you may or may not already be familiar with. So here's just a list of unit topics that we'll discuss. So we'll start with periodic table, atoms, elements, compounds, then we'll move into chemical reactions, energy, and enzymes, and we'll finish with water solutions and pH. So some basic information for you. Chemistry is the study of matter. So you need to understand that atoms are the building blocks of matter. So the atom is important because that's where we get protons, neutrons, and electrons from. So the nucleus of the atom has protons and neutrons. Remember, protons have a positive charge and neutrons have a neutral charge. And then electrons are located outside of the nucleus and they are negatively charged. So when we look at what is in the nucleus of the atom, quick check, right? Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and then electrons are located around the nucleus. So here's a look at what an atom would look like. So the little E's are electrons, and then you see protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So elements then are composed of atoms. So each element has a unique name and symbol which are located in the periodic table. You should be very familiar with this. It's in your agendas, it's in your textbook. You've seen this before, so the periodic table is all of the elements. Here's a look at the periodic table. So it's organized into periods and groups, and then protons are important because they're related to the atomic number. So periods are going to go horizontal, or this way, and groups go vertical. So when we read information on the periodic table, the number of protons is going to be the atomic number, which is also the number of electrons. And this is in a neutral element, so we're going to assume that it's a neutral element unless you are otherwise told. So the atomic mass, then, is the number of protons and neutrons in an element. And to find the neutrons, then, you take atomic mass rounded. Can't read that, but it says rounded. Divide minus, sorry, the atomic number. And then that gives you number of neutrons. So now let's talk about molecules versus compounds. So atoms are held together in general by covalent bonds, and this forms a molecule. A compound, then, is two or more elements that are combined. And compounds are only broken apart by chemical reactions. So how do we determine the elements in a compound? Well, we're going to use the periodic table using the symbol to figure out what the elements are. So in the following compound, HBr, the elements in this compound are hydrogen and bromine. And when we ask how many of each element that there are, well, you don't see any numbers, so there's one of each. So let's do a little bit more practice. So we're going to first look at H2O. So we have hydrogen and oxygen. And how many of each? There's two hydrogen and only one oxygen. Now let's look at iron oxide. So what elements are in the compound? So we have iron and oxygen. Now calculating the numbers here is going to be a little trickier because you have to distribute. So that 7 gets multiplied by 2, meaning there's 14 iron, and then it gets multiplied by 3, meaning there's 21 oxygen in this compound. So chemical bonds then are, like we said, they're holding things together. So covalent bonds then are when electrons are shared. So think co together. Ionic bonds are when electrons are either lost or given, depending on the bond and the elements involved. So now let's talk about physical versus chemical reactions. So a physical reaction is simply when it's just a change. This can be a change of state. So ice melts to water. This can be a change in appearance. So paper gets
it's crumpled. But no matter what, the structure and what's contained in this those elements is not changed. A chemical reaction, on the other hand, there's going to be a change. And we'll go over some specifics in just a minute. But an example of a chemical reaction would be photosynthesis. So basically, if you're getting something different than what you started with at the end and you can't change it back, it's a chemical reaction. If you can change it back, like up here with our water, right, you can refreeze water into ice, it's a physical reaction. So here's some signs then of a chemical reaction. So things like a color change, a precipitates form, a gas is formed, or there's an energy change. Now let's talk about chemical equations. So with a chemical equation, the arrow is what indicates the process or the movement of change. And this always moves from reactants to products. So an example, if we take hydrogen and oxygen, we get water. And if we're going to equal it out, there should be a two there and a two there. So hydrogen plus oxygen makes water. So now let's work on balancing them out. So this is the one I just did. So to show you kind of what to do. So this little number here is what's there. You can never change it. You can only change the numbers that are in front. So we have two oxygen on this side and two hydrogen. But on this side, we have two hydrogen and one oxygen. How do we get those numbers to equal? Well, you want to look for common factors. So in order to get two oxygen, let's do that one first. We would put a two here. So now we have four hydrogen and two oxygen. Well, we're almost there. The only thing left to do is now our hydrogens are off. So to get four hydrogen, you just put a two in front. Now you have four. So that is your balanced reaction. Another important thing to think about is energy diagrams. So energy release or absorption usually signifies some sort of chemical reaction. So this is going to show the available energy. Activation energy then is the minimum amount of energy needed for the reactants to form into products. So the reactants are always on this end and the products are always on this end. So the activation energy is this little hill it has to climb. So all chemical reactions then are either going to take energy or give off energy. And there's two types, exothermic and endothermic. So how do we tell which one is which? The exothermic, think exo, right, releases or gives off heat energy. So on the diagram, the products, which you see right here, their available energy is going to be lower than the starting energy of the reactants. So you're going to go downhill. An endo, think in or inside, an endothermic reaction absorbs the heat or takes that energy in. So our reactants start pretty low here, but then look at our products. If you're looking at available energy, the products end up way higher than where the reactant started. So this means that energy was taken in. So enzymes are also important to reactions because they act as something called a catalyst. So a catalyst is something that causes or accelerates a chemical reaction. But it's very important to note that they do not increase the amount of the product made. They just increase the efficiency. So it's done in a better method. So here's some examples of enzymes and what they're used for in our bodies. So they're used in photosynthesis. We use them for cell respiration. They're used for growth, removal of waste, DNA replication, and movement. Catalysts are very, very important to our bodies. So enzymes then, how do they even work? Well, there's three parts that's involved in this enzyme reaction. So you have the substrate first, which is the substance that's acted on by the enzyme. Then you have the active site. This is the specific site where the bonding occurs. So if I were to trace this, down here, that is the active site. And then the enzyme, of course, is what's going to attach to the substrate. So there's something else that can happen to enzymes called denaturing. So when enzymes are denatured, such as 
heat exposure, exposure to a high acidic product, something that's going to change them, it changes their structure. So that change in structure means the enzyme and the substrate no longer fit together like they're supposed to, and then as a result, the processes can't happen. We're also going to talk about properties of water briefly. So there are eight properties of water you need to know, and these are the eight. We're not going to get into details of all of them. Um, we'll talk a little bit more in class about these, but these are the eight that you need to know. Now on to types of solutions. So first we're going to talk about a couple of key terms here, solvent and solute. The easiest way to remember how these work is a solvent plus a solute equals a solution. But if you look at them alphabetically, U comes before V, so U goes into V. Most of the time, when you think of a common thing, a solute such as hot chocolate powder goes into the solvent, which is water or milk, if you like creamy or hot chocolate, creating a solution. The solution is the hot chocolate. So the solute is what gets dissolved. And the solvent is what does the dissolving. And together, they make a solution. So there's also two types of solutions you need to know. So there's a homogeneous solution, which homo, the prefix, means same. So it has the uniform or same composition throughout, something like the Kool-Aid man over here. So anything that it doesn't, you can't tell the difference, you can't see where it's combined is a homogeneous solution. Hetero, genius, hetero meaning different, is going to be a mixture that has very distinct components. So when you look at the M&Ms down here, they have very distinct colors. You look at the seed mix over here, you can see the different beans and seeds that are in there. Then pH, so I'm sure you're familiar to some extent with pH. The pH scale itself runs 0 to 14. In the middle is 7, which is neutral, and water has a pH of 7. And then acids are anything that are below the pH of 7, and bases are anything above the pH of 7. And if you look below, there's some different pictures and items that have very commonly known pHs. And that is all for your notes.